I would also like to introduce John Hare tonight to get us started. Thanks, Tess. It's great to have you being our engineer. Uh, good evening, members, friends, and guests. Welcome to the Battle of Homestead Foundation's 2022 program series. I'm John Hare, uh, BHF Board President. Tonight, we'll dig deep in the fertile soil of the social history of our country. We'll cover a period in which most of us silverheads uh, lived and worked. And we'll talk about how this history shapes all our lives and the future. Our focus is on the tumultuous era of the 1970s and 80s, specifically the new legions of women toiling in a changing American workplace, dominated as usual by men. Documentary Oscar winners, the remarkable filmmakers, Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar, campaigned a stirring people's history in their recent movie, Nine to Five, A Story of a Movement. We hope you were able to see it. If you did, you saw our panelists tonight, the incomparable activists who, with many others, actually made this history as spokeswomen, organizers, strategists, trainers, and leaders of a new women-centered labor movement. Panelists Ellen Cassidy, Ann Hill, and Kim Cook will be introduced to you by our Battle of Homestead Foundation treasurer, Rosemary Trump. And Rosemary will serve as moderator for the event. Following discussion with our star guests, there will be a question and answer period. Everyone, please write out your questions to the, to the speakers and post them on the chat. We won't be able to get to them all, but we'll do our best in the time allotted. Uh, program committee member, Nathan Ruggles, will curate the questions and forward them to the moderator. Uh, let me briefly tell you about the Battle of Homestead Foundation. Our founders were inspired by a dramatic labor conflict, the 1892 Battle of Homestead. The nation's eyes then were on the thriving, this thriving industrial town 12 miles downriver from Pittsburgh. The strong union, the amalgamated, had built powerful alliances within the workforce and the community and region. They had to, to defend their labor contract and its high compensation and work standards. Their employer, the Carnegie Steel Company, a monopoly coal and steel empire controlled by Andrew Carnegie and his henchman, Henry Clay Frick, was determined to cut wages and break the union. When the contract expired, Frick built an eight foot high wall around the mill, locked out the workers, and launched plans to import scab labor. An epic struggle ensued, which despite extraordinary resilience and militance yeah. by the workers and their allies, ultimately resulted in defeat for the union. That's because 7,000 state militia were sent in by the governor to occupy the mill and protect scab labor. There are many stories and revolutions and revelations within this epic, far too many to relate tonight. The more we dig deeper and learn, we discover and celebrate the seeds of hope in that resilient workers and community struggle. Our mission is to grow those seeds by promoting a people's history, but also we work to empower today's workforce and build strategies for a future that benefits all working families and our nation. Our goal is to develop a regional center and institute for labor history and the future of work. Two years ago, about this time, the COVID pandemic forced us to change how we do work. Our public panels, historic commemorations, concerts, and drama are now presented online with, publicly, uh, with publicity generated by social media. Social media. Actually, we've discovered new opportunities to reach out, educate, fundraise, and organize. Today, the seeds of hope still sprout anew, even as our country faces major social, economic, and political crises. But crisis can also mean opportunity. Uh, now, since November 3rd, 2020, we can begin to see the light. We take heart and recognize the tremendous organizing by grassroots groups throughout the nation, many women-led, often in coalitions with organized labor. This heroic effort was the engine that expanded the electorate 
giving voice to millions of average working people. Thus was propelled the election defeat of a mendacious anti-democratic president and his morally bankrupt enablers. Uh, tonight, we celebrate creative grassroots working, uh, workplace organizing and alliance building. We're optimistic about our mission as we see the growth of power for working women and men and their communities. So we say to you, come join us. More about our exciting pro uh, upcoming programs in the wrap up tonight. Uh, now I'm delighted to give the mic to Rosemary Trump, our own labor hero. Rosemary organized thousands of public sector and healthcare workers into newly chartered Service Employees International locals in the 1970s. She headed the Pittsburgh based SEIU Local 585 as president for more than 30 years. Her leadership was recognized when she was elected a vice president and executive board member by National Service Employees International Union, the first woman in such position in the union's history. Um, I was going to tell you about the uh, clerical organizing campaign at the University of Pittsburgh in 1979, uh, but it turned out it wasn't exactly part of 925 as yet. Um, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I'm very pleased and happy and proud to introduce our hero, uh, Rosemary Trump. Rosemary. Oh, uh, thank you, John. Thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction. I was uh, uh, saying that I'm, I'm flattered and honored. But uh, listen, what an exciting evening uh, to celebrate National Women's History Week by honoring the women who founded the national movement to organize clerical workers, as well as the women who came forward to champion equal work for equal pay, an end to sexual harassment in the workplace, racial equality, and a voice for women office workers. Um, how many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have been able to watch Julia Wright, Gert, and Steve Bognar's documentary, Nine to Five, A Story of a Movement in Advance of This Evening? Uh, please raise your hand or use the thumbs up at the bottom of your screen to indicate your affirmative answer. So how many? All right, well, uh, I think that's terrific. Most of us have uh, been able to see this energizing and inspirational film. And for those who haven't, that's okay because our panelists are going to talk about the issues the movie tried to illustrate and raise. Plus, we are now going to show a four minute clip to refresh our memory of the documentary and set the stage for our discussion. Tess, do you want to run it, please? You got it. Okay. I was a clerk typist at Harvard. There was nobody else in the office except for me, and a student comes in and looks me dead in the eye and says, isn't anybody here? Yes. Can't you see me? I'm right in front of your eyes. I'm here. You may act like you want the secretary, but most of the time they're looking for something between you. Back then, women in the workplace were there either as decorations, as sexual objects, as wives. Why are you women bitching? It's a wonderful world. A wonderful world when you're white and male and in charge. The boss who made his secretary clean his dentures or the boss who made his secretary sew up his pants while he had them on, like a crotch. How many times did you sew my slides? Once. <laughs> it's not bad. They even have to switch on a clock that times them on the toilet. Men always gotta pay more. And they could say very easily, well, if you don't like the way we operate this, you leave. Most secretary jobs are dead end jobs. It was the lack of opportunity. You were kind of stuck wherever you entered. 42 million women workforce now, and in some cases, that's led to a new version of sex discrimination. It's called sexual harassment. My boss touched my breasts. He 
rubbed up against me. If you had a problem, if your supervisor was unfair, you had no recourse. There was nowhere to go. There was nowhere to go. Nothing, nothing ever changed. I can't take much more of this. Something, somewhere, sometime is going to snap. If we don't fight for dignity and respect on the job, Who's going to make, who's going to fight for us? We started 9 to 5 in 1973 in Boston. 150 women showed up at the first meeting. Yes, it was the first meeting of many. We were all for cybers. We were all starting in the blue foot. Susie, what beautiful flowers. Secret admirer. <laughs> My boss for National Secretaries Week. Raises, not roses. That's what women who marched in this picket line wanted. Clerical workers are fed up with low pay and bad benefits. Some bosses regard their secretaries as office wives who shouldn't be as willing to make coffee as take a memo. Today, some of the office wives said they want a divorce. Their job description does not include making coffee. The coffee rebellion was on. Private hurts became public issues. Steam is building. I am not going to talk with you. I am not going to deal with you. Employer teaches to inform you of your illegal application form, which violates state law. He was inspired by the film Nine to Five, where we well, had. He inspired the film Nine to Five. You was, yes, you did. I went to Nine to Five office, and there were, I think there were about forty or fifty women. And I would listen to them. I'm on a webinar. I'm a sexist, egotistical, lying, hypocritical bigot. I'm bigot. The entire time that we were working on it, I could carry in my heart the fact that this was married to a movement. What the movie does show is when you organize and join together, you can have tremendous power. Grassroots organizing is great that way. It shows people what they have inside them. How long will you continue this fight? As long as it's necessary. It just it's hard it to changed describe. changed everything. It changed everything. All right. Wow. Um, what, I, what can I say? Wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Um, we are fortunate to have three of the original founders of this historic movement with us tonight who began their careers organizing clerical workers in those early 70s. And, and here it is, hard to believe, some 50 years later. And they're still active in the social uh, justice movement. I will tell you that these are women who radically changed history. In fact, they made it her story. And I, I, will, and I will share that I am so proud to call them my sisters, my friends, and my sheroes. Um, and I will begin our program by introducing the three panelists and then ask each of them questions related to their roles in the nine to five movement, followed by questions that uh, all three will respond to. But if you have a question, uh, you're welcome to ask it in the uh, chat, and Nathan Ruggles will curate them for our question and answer period at the end of our program. But let me first introduce Ellen Cassidy. Ellen is, in fact, the earliest founder of 9 to 5. Uh, she, with Karen Nussbaum, were the co-organizers that started the clerical organizing in Boston in the early 70s. And next will be our own Ann Hill, Pittsburgh's own, uh, who began her career by organizing the University of Pittsburgh Clericals in the late 70s and then went off to Cleveland, Ohio to head up the nine to five efforts in that city. And then Kim Cook, Kim is going to be interviewed about her role in representing 26,000 education and public service workers in Washington State as head of District 925 SEIU. So first, uh, I'm going to go to Ellen uh, as the senior participant uh, in this uh, panel. And Ellen, I'm going to ask you, uh, you were a founder of 9 to 5 in 1973. Tell us why you think 9 to 5 came about just then. I mean, why, why in the early 70s did clericals want to organize into associations and unions? Well, as uh, the historian Lane Windham says in the documentary, it was the coming together of two rivers, the economic and the cultural. 
So you had millions of women flooding into the workforce. 12 million women joined the workforce in the 1970s. And 1973 was really the great tipping point where one job per family was no longer enough. And this was a new situation for many white families that had been a familiar one to women of color whose workforce participation had long outstripped that of white women. But in 1973, for the first time since World War II, families found that uh, they could no longer get by on one job and that they were looking toward a future that was less prosperous than the uh, generation before. So women had to work, but increasingly women wanted to work because of the civil rights movement and the women's movement bringing new ideas to our society. Um, women, the ideas of women's equality had really taken hold and more and more women expected to be treated equally on the job and treated with respect. Now, as you just saw in the clip, there were more women clericals than women working in any other job. And uh, this was a very diverse group. It was women with a high school education for whom an office job was a step up for their family. It was women with college educations who never expected that they would be considered 10 typing fingers um, and expected a professional career and were thwarted in that desire. Um, it was white women, it was women of color, it was young women, it was old women. And women looked around at each other and thought we're all women and felt united as women. So um, we were all facing these same common problems, um, doing work that men did, but for less pay, um, shocked to find that we were being paid less than blue collar workers. Many of us were expected to do, to do all kinds of favors for our bosses make the coffee, get the boss's lunch, and worse, our jobs were dead end. Um, back then, we didn't have the expression, the glass ceiling, but um, we had that reality. And clerical work, as somebody said, was generally a direct stepping stone to more clerical work, especially <laughs> if you're good at it. And we were invisible. When people thought, who's the typical worker? You'd think about a man in a, with a hard hat or... Uh, holding a wrench. Um, but in fact, we were a huge part of the workforce. And we came to believe that we were the heirs to the mill women and the garment workers of the turn of the 20th century who had organized and whose slogan was bread and roses. And our slogan, raises and roses, was kind of an echo of those women's cause. Good. Well, so what were some of the challenges you faced as you began organizing these women office workers? Um, I think the main thing that I would cite would be that as women and as members of American society, we had been brought up to think of ourselves as individuals first. And everything went through that individual lens. So if you were unhappy on your job, it's your fault. And uh, maybe there's something wrong with you. And at best, you might try dressing for success or um, taking a class. But the idea that um, mm -hmm. joining together was really going to be the solution to these problems was really unfathomable for a lot of people. And of course, employers did their best to promote that thought. And they benefited from it. Because if you, if you didn't think that it was worth it to join together, your power was really not very great. So there was no history of organizing in the office. And just the idea that you would even like pass out a leaflet or get a little group together at lunch or um, march into the boss and say, we want better, was just not on people's radar screen. Supervisors were watching people like a hawk and the big banks and insurance companies. You could not get up from your desk without somebody looking at you. Um, and then, of course, women had to go home right after work for their second shift of work, the housework, the childcare. And uh, I guess I should also mention that employers were on to us right away, right from the start. They knew what we were up to, and they were determined to stamp out organizing. So we had to figure out ways to get around those constraints. And so what were some of those ways you figured out how to meet these challenges and what were you able to achieve? Well, um, I guess the first thing was that we didn't really know what we were doing. We were, you know, 23 years old, but we kind of 
had this attitude, you know, we were pretty gutsy and we just kind of followed our nose and tried to figure out what was possible. So um, we, we had to figure out how to give people um, opportunities to take action and to have that experience of working together with others to make change. Um, and that was kind of a bumbling uh, enterprise for us. So for example, um, I remember I had gotten together a group of women who worked in publishing houses in Boston. That was a big industry in Boston. And the Boston Globe Book Festival was coming up and, I, and we all thought great idea, great place to try to meet people and, and get something going. So we're sitting around in a little group and I said, um, well, maybe we should have a picket line. Let's make signs and you know go in a circle around the, the festival and everybody will be there and they'll all see us and it'll be a really feisty way to get going. And there was this dead silence. And then someone else said, um, maybe we could rent a table at the festival, pass out a survey. And that's what we did. It was a huge success. We got all these survey returns and pretty soon we had a huge network of women who worked in the publishing industry. We had all their names and their, their positions. And from there, we progressed to filing uh, charges, lawsuit, starting a union at one or two companies and uh, won huge back pay awards. And it was, it was a great, it really took off, but it took really being able to listen to what women were ready to do. And they were not ready for a picket line on day one. They were not. So we had to listen very carefully and come up with things that were safe for people to, to do that were things that would not uh, make them lose their jobs, that wouldn't be too embarrassing, um, that they felt like comfortable doing. And that was a big part of our organizing. Terrific. Well. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to turn now to um, Anne Hill. Anne, um, how did you reach um, women who didn't consider themselves feminist? What was the secret? <laughs> so, Anne, um, I think you're muted. Oh, you're right. So, okay, there we are. Okay, okay. Good, Anne. All right. Hi, Rosemary. Thank okay. you for yes, having us. Sure. Yeah. Good so to you. The secret of your success. I mean, what you know? How were you able to get reach out to women that, you know, I'm not a feminist. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, first, I want to say hi to Betty Arendt and Gabe Kramer, as well as John Hare, old friends who were in the trenches together at, at different points in our in our organizing. Um. So it's nice to see them. Um, so I think that uh, one of the secrets of nine to five was that we um, we tried to meet people where they were, women where they were, and uh, you know the the women's movement, the the liber women's liberation movement. We were just coming; um, it was in full force, and we were coming off of that. But we. Uh, Clerical workers were not really in to women's lib, and and all the uh, rhetoric and the um, the uh, direction that it had taken. And so, what we tried to step back, and as as Ellen said, uh, listen to people to uh, the women we were interested in organizing. We had a lot of one on one um, discussions with people over lunch, after work. Uh, whenever we could find the opportunity, uh, we were constantly meeting with people one-on-one uh, -on -one or in very small groups, and we 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 had to become good listeners in order to um, know what people what women cared about. Um, and I would say that um, you know, so we didn't try to turn them into women's livers or turn them into feminists. We we tried to learn from them by listening, and then we could respond. And you know, we knew that the issues were there. We we knew that there was there were a lot of issues in the workplace um, the clerical workers were facing that they cared about and that were ripe for change. And we simply needed to. Um, listen to them and then figure out ways to bring those issues uh, to, to employers, to the public and, and to the forefront of, of the discussion that was going on. Um, 
we we also tried to um, create an organization that was one we wanted to belong to, as Karen said, uh, I think uh, once that. So it was an organization in which it was very creative, uh, both 9T05 and uh, the district, uh, District 925. Um, we used a lot of music, a lot of song. We would rewrite songs all the time and sing them. Um, we we used activities on the uh, on the street that were not hardline picket lines, but maybe they had balloons, maybe they had uh, funny things, ways to help women who were not strident, who were not part of the movement already, uh, help them be comfortable and, and be attracted to an organization that they would want to, to find out more about. So I think the, the kind of fun and creativity that we brought to organizing and which really uh, lasted all the way through, and I'm sure Kim Cook could talk about um, using some of that in Seattle, in the most recent uh, organizing that's gone on up there, uh, it really carried us through many, many years of organizing. Um, well, good. So then how did women become leaders in the 9T05 and the District 925 or District 9 to 5 uh, organizations? And maybe you want to go into a little explanation of the difference between 9T05 and 925, the numer numerical number, or District 9 to 5. Right. Yeah, for those who aren't familiar with the two different organizations, I mean, Ellen Cassidy was talking about 9T05, the National Association of Working Women. And it's what began in Boston in, in, 90, in 1973. Um, and then it moved across the country. And there were many, many chapters of 9T05, uh, the National Association of Working Women. Um, in 1981, we decided to create the union um, no, that's not right. That's not right. There was a local 925 in Boston before the National Union. Um, and that was what year? Uh, Ellen was local 925? I think it was 1975. 1975. 1975. Okay. So um, Boston created a local um, 925. And then in 1981, we went national with uh, the union and um, create and started organizing in, in Cleveland and Cincinnati and um, other places, Syracuse and other places around the country, anywhere we could try to um, organize uh, women into the union, which, which was a tall order at that point. Sure. And how, did, how were you able to develop leadership for those organizations? Yeah, I think that um, we knew we wanted an organization that reflected the workforce we were uh, organizing. So we knew um, we wanted a diverse organization, a diverse leadership in Cleveland, where we had a significant African-American population. Uh, we were very, very committed um, to uh, bringing women of color into the leadership positions right off the bat, right from the get go. And I don't think we would have been successful if we hadn't done that. Um, so for instance, at Cuyahoga Community College, which is a large uh, community college in, in the Cleveland area, and we organized there from the get go, we, we met with African-American women. You know, in every workplace, there's their natural leaders. And one of the jobs of the organizer is to find those natural leaders. And there are other leaders that can follow, but you really need to find the natural leaders first, I think, to be the most successful. And, um, and so, for instance, in this workplace, which uh, had a very diverse uh, clerical workforce, we uh, went immediately to the natural African-American leaders and and met with them one-on-one -on -one and, and asked them to be part and leadership, uh, part of the leadership of, of the organizing committee. So we built organizing committees, we built negotiating committees that reflected the workforce that we were organizing. Thank you. So uh, what do you think uh, that the nine to five movement accomplished during your career? I think, um, 
I mean, we did organize a lot of women into unions that got contracts and got um, protection in the workplace. But then the bigger picture, I think we uh, changed the debate where we really introduced the debate initially about what, it, what is happening with women on the job. And, and then we were able to, I mean, you saw in the, 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 the trailer, the clips, um, of Phil Donahue and Walter Cronkite and um, the, the movie just, the, the documentary just gives you a snippet of the press coverage that we got. But in fact, Karen Nussbaum was doing press all the time. I mean, she was all over the country. There was a lot of press, both television as well as uh, local papers when there used to be, there used to be newspapers locally. Um, and so we really were able to change the debate about women in the workforce and, uh, and, the, fa and the issues that um, were faced. Race and, dis and sex discrimination was a big part of the discussion and that had not really happened before. Um, in Cleveland, we brought lawsuit against a, a, a major bank. It was a race and sex discrimination lawsuit. Um, the Department of Labor uh, took up the issue as well. And it, it completely um, changed the way people thought about uh, women at work. And so that I think was probably our biggest accomplishment. Um, and then of course we did, we did negotiate contracts that are still in effect are still uh, protecting people and won a lot of gains for women in the, in the workplace. Well, thank you. So now I wanna to turn to uh, Kim Cook. So Kim, um, your tenure inside of uh, District 925 uh, was, none, it was more with the union than the association. What was your path for getting involved and moving into leadership? Well, hi, Rosemary. Yes, hey, hello. Yes, Ms. Good. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for hosting <laughs> this, everyone. It's really a, a pleasure to be with you. Um, I actually wanted to, in response to that question, I actually wanted to add on to Anne's answer about what I think um, our union and our association accomplished, Anne, because not only did we make huge strides, I think, in terms of women's issues and, um, you know, the changes in, um, you know, just even the language and the laws around women at work. Um, but I, I think that our part of our biggest legacy is the development of women as leaders um, in the labor movement. Um, and I know, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm of the same generation as Ellen and Anne, but I came to the, to the association <laughs> a little bit later and stayed a little bit longer. Um, and so I saw the, um, I saw, I think the accomplishment and the impact and legacy of nine to five in the labor movement itself, like mm -hmm. incredible women leaders uh, in SEIU and other unions who came through nine to five first, right? This was where they learned uh, to be activists. This is where they learn skills. And uh, my story of how I got involved in the union and became a leader in SEIU is all about um, how incredibly well 9 to 5 did that, right? I got out of college, like a lot of people in the late 70s, got a job as a clerical worker, found Seattle Working Women, 905. Uh, and in that organization as a member, I learned, you know, I think so you see some of this in the in the in the film. You know, I learned to make a speech in front of 500 people I've never stood in front of. I learned to run a meeting, right? I learned some really a lot of fundamentals about organizing and and skills. And so, after that experience of being a member in Nine to Five, I actually uh, a few years later got hired as an organizer uh, in in uh, what was then District Nine to Five in '81, and um, went on. Uh, to develop my, develop my leadership as uh, in SEIU. I became an organizer for years and years, and then I went on to become a, a regional organizing director and then the president of 925 and an international uh, vice president following in your footsteps, Rosemary. You were like, <laughs> you, were my, you were my mentor, my hero back then to have women like you in SEIU to, to follow. So um, I think that a part of our accomplishment and legacy was 
um, what we brought to the labor movement in terms of leadership development and women's leadership. And I feel very proud of that. So what do you think are the um, most important organizing lessons you've learned from your years with nine to five? Well, you know, I, I actually do think of myself as an organizer still today, even though I am a labor educator at Cornell. Um, and, but even as the president of the union, I, um, all of the years I was in uh, SEIU and in 95, I thought of myself as an organizer. Um, and the skills that I learned as an organizer made it possible to be a leader. Um, and so it was, um, clearly it was that leadership development is core. It's the most important skill. And Anne, you said this, the most important skill uh, as an organizer is that you know how to find, develop, and support the development of other leaders, right? Who are representative of the workforce uh, and so on. Um, I would say that the other thing I wanna just say, cause I think this is really true of nine to five, although I suppose some people might disagree with me, is that I really learned relational organizing, which is to say that we learned how important it is to develop relationships with people in order to have confidence and trust and respect for the people that who are frankly taking risks every day um, to organize a union or to, uh, to step up and stand up to the boss or to whoever it is that we're fighting, right? And um, so I actually, you know, have this interesting uh, argument often with people uh, about whether organizing is about issues that moves people by something that they care about and they want to see change, or whether it's about rela building relationships with people and helping them have the confidence, right, to step up and do something about something they want to see change. And, you know, I suspect it's some of both, but I feel very strongly about uh, that nine to five taught me relational organizing. And that was uh, one of my most important, um, I think, uh, lessons. And I just want to add some stuff that I think Ellen and, and Anne already said is that uh, for me, the most important part of organizing was being creative and having fun. And um, if we, man, if we weren't enjoying ourselves, what the hell are we doing here, right? We better, we better like what we're doing. And, um, and we took that lesson very seriously. Thank you, Ian. Even as I was the president of the union many, many years later, and um, we, we still, you know, we did flash mobs at actions instead of just, you know, chanting and marching. And uh, so we, uh, we, we, we take that history and that legacy seriously at nine to five. <laughs> Terrific. So, so how have you kept that energy going? I mean, you're, how have you been able to be an organizer all these years? I mean, uh, what, what motivates you? Yeah, the, um, I, you know, when I think back about my years of how I stayed in, like I talk to young uh, students at Cornell all the time about getting into the labor movement. People want a job in the labor movement. Um, and I, and, you know, unlike others who say, go to law school, whatever, I'm like, you gotta be an organizer first. That is really what you have to do if you wanna be in the labor movement, you wanna stay in it and you wanna grow in it, right? You wanna move up in leadership because those are the most important fundamental skills and it will give you a real sense of, of workers, right? You, like, you can't organize without actually really understanding what workers care about, what, they're, what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, um, you know, building those kind of skills, being an organizer is really, really important. So over the years, when I look back on what kept me in, um, it was those deep relationships that we build with each other, our friendships across nine to five, certainly, you know, I had, I had so much respect for the women who were other leaders um, in this union, Anne, Ellen, Karen, Debbie, all of the people uh, who I worked with, I loved and respected them. Um, and our members, like, right, Rosemary, you know this, right? The members of our union uh, were so wonderful and what kept us going, uh, right, on a daily basis. They were courageous uh, and they were um, really amazing. So um, I would say that's what has kept me going all these years. Oh, thank you for your energy. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna go back to Ellen, Ellen. Um, you know, the Battle of Homestead Foundation is about remembering and learning from the past. Uh, so what does 9 to 5 have to teach us? I mean, uh, what, you know, what, what is the foundation of 9 to 5 and how we can remember and honor the past and move forward? And by, by responding that, I'd like for you to tell us about your new book that's coming out. Yes. Um... 
I, uh, the day after the Women's March, when Donald Trump was um, inaugurated, I looked out at this sea of women, you know, hundreds of thousands of women came to Washington, D.C. Uh, with their pink pussy hats on. And uh, people just packed together. They couldn't move. There were so many of them. And I knew I had some people who were staying in my house and they'd never been in a demonstration before. And I felt like this is like the nine to five women. This is, this is the kind of people who join nine to five and they, they had never been involved in anything before. This is, you know, this is it. And so I decided that um, I should, I, I'm a writer. I've been a writer for many years and um that I should write a book about what it was like to organize nine to five. And I did. And uh, I have this book called uh, Working Nine to Five, which is coming out in September. Um, and uh, it, it's a personal story. And something that was really important to me was, um, you know, we've talked about natural leaders and finding leaders and so on. I was maybe not a natural leader, but I developed as a leader through nine to five. And um, for me, it was step by step by step. I was afraid to make phone calls while well, I wrote out a script and hello, this is Ellen Cassidy. I'm calling for nine to five. Um, and then, you know, and we guided women through those steps one after the other um, and and got very good at, at sort of reading what somebody is is ready for and, and taking them through those steps until they were making a speech in front of 500 people, as Kim said, and so on. So my book is, it's very personal and it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's humble um, because we, I think we accomplished great things, but we started out like ordinary people. And, um, and that I just think is a, just a really heartwarming story um, that I think people today can learn from, not by, okay, what did they do? Let's read the rule book. I'm going to do that same thing. But um, how can we take in what, what was done in the past and then forge our own path to the future? Well, I know I'm looking forward to reading it and it's coming out of a wonderful time in September, which means I can buy it for Christmas presents. Uh, Labor Day presents, present. right. And uh, we have put up the link to uh, where you could purchase it. Uh, so please um, save your chat and uh, make a note of it. And maybe you want to add it to your wish list or your... Christmas present list, and uh, it's going to be a great read. I know, Ellen, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you so much for doing it, that's for sure. So now I would like to go into the part of the program where all three of you feel free to comment about any of my questions, uh, uh, speak up, and, um, uh, you know, this is, this is really the fun part where you all get to have a conversation among yourselves. So, uh, you know, I... I would, I would like to ask, well, what challenges do you still think remain out there uh, to conquer? I mean, you know, you've been at it now for 50, 50 years, unbelievably. <laughs> so uh, what else is out there to, uh, to address? So who, who wants to uh, first uh, go uh, forward on that answer? Is isn't it amazing, you guys, like the whole Me Too thing that happened the last couple of years when you think about how long we have been fighting about sexual harassment, right? And that it still surfaces in these really huge, ugly ways, right? I mean, we at least have laws now and we know what to call it, um, but in so many industries, it just, you know, hasn't changed and we have to keep fighting those fights over and over again. Yeah, and I think um, in fact, well, we, we achieved a lot. The wage gap has narrowed, uh, it's not, you know, 100% yet, um, but it, it has gotten better. There are many more opportunities for women um, in the workplace, but uh, in many ways, to be a working person today is harder than it was back then. The gig economy, the precarious jobs, no pensions, health, health insurance, you know, people having, uh, you know, contract work, freelance work, Nine to five is no longer the standard for many people. They're either 24 seven jobs or they patch together four or five different part-time jobs. So um, the challenges are many. 
And fortunately, there are a lot of organizations that uh, and, and efforts that have gotten going. The National Domestic Workers Association has its own Bill of Rights, just the way we had our Clerical Workers Bill of Rights. Um, gig workers rising, uh, Amazon workers, Starbucks workers, um, and people are, uh, the Fight for 15, coworker.org. There are many, many different creative formats for organizing both traditional unions and outside of the traditional NLRB format. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So, um, so how has the labor movement changed since Reagan came into office in 1980? I mean, <laughs> what's been the trajectory? I mean, uh, from when you began in the 70s to, you know, now after 40 years of Reaganism. Well, you know, Karen makes the point in the in the movie that our timing couldn't have been worse because we started uh, District 9 to 5, the union in 1981 and um, right on the heels of Ronald Reagan busting PATCO, uh, the the pilots union or the not the pilots. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Yeah. Air traffic uh, controllers. Air traffic controllers union. And um you know, so we we were not really able to organize in the private sector the way we wanted to. We mm -hmm. wanted to uh, to organize insurance workers and bank workers, and because um, because of that of Reagan busting Patco, he unleashed a huge um, anti union effort um, in, in the country in which. Um, the the anti-union consulting firms and attorney firms um, rose uh, and were really were hired by uh, employers just uh, for big bucks to bust the any union that tried to organize and certainly they went after District Nine to Five in in Syracuse, uh, New York. We organized some insurance workers and what did they do? They closed the office and moved it to a, a southern state. Um, so we, so as Karen said, the, the timing wasn't, wasn't good. And, um, I think we suffered for decades really from that. Um, and even today, I mean, now we, for, for the first time in how long we've, uh, really from, for, for the first time since we began organizing, we have a president who endorses labor organizing, you know, mm -hmm. none of the others did Republicans or Democrats, and uh, we'll see if that makes a difference. Um, certainly we'll have a better labor relations board, uh, but um, labor organizing has been really, really difficult over the past 50 years. And I, and I just think in terms of, of the labor movement itself inside of unions, what's changed certainly, and Rosemary, you may even know this better than we do, that um, I love I love in the movie where Karen's talking about when we were interviewed by different what when they were interviewed by different unions and how we were treated like you know pats on the head or worse right uh, by the men in labor unions who didn't take us seriously didn't want to organize women workers and so on and um, and you know when we came in you know when I came into the into nine to five uh, with you all um, you know I. I think other people too, I didn't see a labor movement that reflected me at all, right? And I wanted a union that reflected me. There weren't enough women in leadership, Rosemary, you, I think you were probably the only one for a very long time at SEIU. Uh, there weren't enough women, there weren't enough people of color. And um, I, I think that has changed certainly in the last 50 years, that has, has changed. Um, it's not good enough, it's not, not changed enough in all unions. Um, but I think there has been a commitment over this period to uh, try to really um, recruit in, uh, a div more diverse leadership uh, in most, uh, at least most progressive unions in this country. So that's one change, I think. That and I think that one of the interesting things about that is that there were literally a handful of women like Rosemary who were fighting tooth and nail to, to organize uh people into unions and to be in leadership. But when nine to five district nine to five came along, it was like a whole organization of women. It wasn't an individual woman here and there. It was a whole organization 
of right. women led by women. Um, and so it had a different kind of impact, um, I think, on the labor movement. And they had to reckon with us, e even though they don't want to, we didn't want to. And, you know, I have to give John Sweeney a lot of credit because he, he championed District 9 to 5. And um, he gave us a budget. He gave us almost all control over that budget. Uh -huh. um, and he took us seriously. And um, he really wanted us to succeed. And, and he did that even with, you know, the old guard male unionists around the country not being very happy about it. Um, so I think that, you know, John Sweeney deserves a lot of credit for being willing to take a chance with us. And uh, it didn't turn out the way we all wanted it to, but we did make some progress for sure. So Anne, do you want to expand on who John Sweeney was? Oh, 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 oh John Sweeney. John Sweeney was the president of SCIU at the time that we were shopping around for a union and it really wasn't a very difficult <laughs> decision. There was really nowhere else to go, but Sweeney, uh, you know, uh, worked a, worked out a plan with Karen Nussbaum and um, basically to, you know, to give us a budget, to let her hire organizers and uh, to really give it a shot. And for many years, you know, it uh, wasn't just a one, a couple of year commitment on his part. And so, then he got a promotion, right? And then he got a promotion to the head of the AFL-CIO. That's right. right. Yes, exactly. So uh, no, there's no doubt about it. John Sweeney was a, a gigantic uh, leader of labor and uh, a true advocate of women. He certainly gave me every opportunity and I certainly hold him in the highest regard and and uh, God rest him in power, I mean, and uh, because he was a uh, giant of a labor leader, absolutely. So thank absolutely. you. For and he about died that. a couple of years ago. And um, one of the things that people remembered about him was that when uh, there a meeting was held in his office, he would offer to get the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> he never offered to get me coffee, Ellen. I don't know about you. <laughs> Uh, for sure. That, and and I th I'm glad you raised that because, you know, thanks to you and the movement and the movie and the song and the empowerment of the women, we're no longer expected to always get to coffee. So, I mean, all of you clericals out there, uh, remember that. Uh, that once upon a time, that was just a uh, expected duty of men, many <laughs> on your part of being a woman office worker. <laughs> so thank you for raising that. And, and Rosemary, as, as you mentioned the movie, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's worth pointing out what Jane Fonda said in the documentary that um, the movie was married to a movement. And that made the move, movie more powerful than it otherwise would have been um, because there was this movement going on of women organizers. And she actually went around the country, you know, speaking at um, movie showings of like I know in, in Cleveland, we had the premier showing of nine to five with Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda and Dolly Parton and you know, so that that was another opportunity to reach women who we otherwise wouldn't have reached. And we were we were in heaven with that movie. That was huge. Um, I think that changed so many people's minds. And, you know, people when the movie was being made, we were a little nervous about it. we knew it was going to be a comedy and were they going to get it right? Well, they did get it right. And I think they were really they were correct in making a comedy instead of an earnest didactic movie. And the point was made, you know, the, there's the boss is a creep. The boss is an idiot. And the women run the office without him. And hard, hardly anyone notices that he's gone when they've kidnapped him and tied him up in his McMansion. Um, <laughs> and it, it really, uh, you know, in some ways the debate was over after that movie because it was no longer a question that there was discrimination and that women were not born wanting to be in the lowest positions in the, in the workforce. 
um, and people, women wanted to be taken seriously and, and be respected. I remember one time right after the movie came out, I was sitting on the bus and I heard these two women talking and one said to the other, well, uh, so I said to him, no, I will not make your coffee. I just saw a nine to five and I'm never going to make your coffee again. And that was <laughs> happening all over the country. No, I mean, and, and really one of my favorite quotes of hers in, your, in the documentary that Julie and Steve made was uh, the, of, of uh, when I say her, I mean, uh, uh, Jane Fonda is the fact that, you know, she gave credit to Dolly Parton of creating your anthem. I mean, you know, the nine to five song. And I, I would just like to, um, you hear more about that from all of you about how you really do believe or what you do believe about the empowerment of the movie and the song, giving credibility to your work and helping you move forward uh, even during the Reagan era of anti-unionism. Uh, do you have an opinion about that? You know, well, I mean, to, clearly, to what degree the song and the, yeah, uh, I mean, they I, have uh, endorsed your, your organizing. Right. I mean, first of all, Dolly Parton's song is brilliant, right? If you listen to the words, it's about, it's about organizing uh, and it's fabulous. But I think as Anne and Ellen just said, it's just like between the song and Dolly Parton's reach and this incredible blockbuster movie, um, talk about, um, you know, culture being able to bring politics uh, to a much broader audience. And even today, you know, I talk to uh, 20 year old students at Cornell and say, do you know the movie nine to five when I start talking about the organizing that we did and it, like light bulbs go out. I mean, even for young people, they, that movie um, uh, gives people a, a you know, place to start in this conversation and, and everybody knows about it. So I think it was really powerful. Terrific. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, um... So I, is it too, is it all right? Ellen, can you talk about the new uh, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin um, and Dolly Parton movie <laughs> that talks about nine to five? She obviously, all of them obviously love you all very much and care about you mm -hmm. and care about the work that you're doing to continue this work with you for over 50 years. So Ellen, do you want to share that? Is that possible? Yeah, I think I think you're referring to another documentary that right. was just that just came out. Um, it just premiered um, at a film festival in Texas, and it's going to be going to film festivals all over the country, and then it will be streamed. Um, it's called Still Working Nine to Five, and the filmmakers went out and they really worked their tails off, and they got interviews with all the important people from the Hollywood movie: Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin. Uh, Dolly Parton, Dabney Coleman, Rita Moreno, who was uh, on the TV show that came out of the movie. Um, and Dolly sings a new version of her nine to five song at the end of this documentary. And they also intersperse those interviews with interviews with me, with Karen Nussbaum, with activists for the ERA, with uh, anti-sexual harassment organizers, and with all the people who are sort of carrying forward the working women's movement. And it, it's just as inspiring as the documentary that we've been talking about here tonight by Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar. Um, so we're really having a moment here. Um, the nine to five legacy is really continuing. A revival. <laughs> Redux. I love it. It's wonderful. I think that just for end, I mean, just shows uh, the degree of the importance of the work uh, that you have been doing and continue to do. And so, uh, uh, so my question is, is um, do we have signs of hope for the future? I mean, what's, what's next? I mean, uh, how, are, how are we gonna continue this trajectory of organizing the service sector and also uh, throughout the, you know, the healthcare workers, the gig workers, the temporary workers, uh, uh, the adjuncts, uh, what, what hope is out there? Does anybody want to talk about the uh, future of labor? And I mean, I'll, I'll just say the obvious, which is that, um, you know, we've all seen the, the statistics on the appeal of unions and the enthusiasm about unions from young people. And um, it is so exciting to me. I mean, I think some of us actually thought we were, those of us who've been active in the labor movement forever kind of thought we were all just going to like, you know, go away and nobody will remember what a union was. And instead, this young generation of 
of, uh, of people really understand the value of organizing, the value of, of fighting and, and support the idea of a union. And I was just recently on a panel with two Starbucks workers and it's not, it's just like a, you know, such, it's, there's no better example of young people sort of taking, um, uh, taking their lives into their hands and organizing at a, at a huge corporation like Starbucks. And it's just taking off a hundred, over 150, uh, you know, in a, in a short period of time, 150 um, shops all over the country have filed for an election. They're doing it on their own, many of them without a lot of union support, frankly. Um, and it's, uh, to me, that's, the, that's incredibly exciting, young people organizing. And is uh, 9 to 5 still active and doing outreach and organizing? There's, there's the district, uh, the district there's, or local? There's the association. You probably know more about it than I do, Ellen. Then there's also the union, of course, the, uh, that still exists that um, I was the president of in Washington State. Washington State local 9 to 5 still exists. They still um, do a lot of really, really great organizing, child care workers, um, higher ed workers, um, they're still they're still fighting the good fight and still committed to organizing uh, workers. So, but nine to five too, right, you guys? Yeah, there's a nine to five organization that um, has been continuously um, in existence since 1973, and nine to five org is how you can reach it. Wonderful. And they've organized a lot of um, they've lo organized around low income uh, women. Uh, in a large part. I mean, there's been a little bit of a change of emphasis um, mm -hmm. for them, but yeah, they're still going great. And, and Kim is being modest about uh, Washington state. I mean, she really built a very large district nine to five there um, that was able to stand on its own. Unlike the unions in the other cities where we weren't large enough to stand on our own, given the changes that were going on, uh, in, in Seattle and Washington State, uh, District 9 to 5 was large enough. And I think it's what, 26,000 now, or is that 26,000 workers? Uh, so it's a major force in, in Washington State. So that, that's a big part of our legacy. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your advice for today's um, activists and organizers and um, people who want to make change and... and um, to continue the movement. Now, what is your advice? Have fun, be creative, <laughs> you know, I like that. Create the kind of organization you want to be a part of um, and, and listen to people, um, hone your skills and help others hone, hone their skills uh, because skills do matter. Learn from the past, but... Um, Make your own way. Yeah, I have to say, keep keep the faith, and um, you know, thick skin matters in this work. You know, <laughs> don't like you win, you lose. Don't take it don't take it personally. Just keep keep moving forward. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's all good advice. That's for sure. And so, um, so are there worker movements that are already inspiring you today? I mean, and if, and if so, what what are those worker movements that are are uh, are uh, capturing your attention and uh, find intriguing. I think you mentioned them, Ellen, the ones that inspire me the most. Uh, certainly um, Five for 15 in a union has right. been incredibly inspiring to all of us. And, and the impact has been powerful, right? Even if there's not a, you know, a traditional union out of that fight, it had the impact of the Five for 15 in terms of raising standards for workers. Uh, has been so impressive. But, um, you know, I'm moved by sort of the organizations that try to organize outside of the traditional models, you know, like um, what used to be the, our Walmart group now is called United for Respect, Coworker, the Uber drivers, the gig workers and that kind of stuff. It's all, I mean, they don't have the luxury of a traditional um, union frame, uh, frame work for organizing. And I'm just impressed with what they all are doing at this point, I should say, finding their, their own way to do this work. Right. And uh, the domestic workers, do we know about the domestic workers organizing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very similar to some of the things that we did in 9 to 5 in that um, it's a very publicly oriented campaign. 
Um, as I mentioned, they have their Bill of Rights for domestic workers, just the way we wrote our Bill of Rights for women office workers. Um, and they're, uh, you know, they don't, they're not negotiating across a, a negotiating table, but they're changing women's lives. Wonderful. Well, that's grand. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the AFL's Working America, because Working America is a non-traditional uh, organizing effort um, that Karen Nussbaum created and has been fabulously successful working in specific states to have um, a bearing and, and, and on, on the political um, uh, makeup of, of the state and what's going on, you know, who, who, who uh, political leadership is going to be in given places. But I think, you know, it's under the auspices of the AFL-CIO and, um, you know, kudos to the AFL-CIO for uh, giving it the support that it has. Terrific. So uh, I'm going to ask Nathan Ruggles, who's been carefully uh, watching the chat and uh, uh, looking for questions that you, the audience, may have asked. So Nathan, uh, is, are there any questions that have come through uh, that you'd want to ask the, our panelists? Uh, well, uh, so many wonderful questions from everyone at this point. They're coming in uh, fast. So uh, let me jump into one here. Uh, this comes from Maura, who, um, uh, Maura Bainbridge. Uh, she is totally inspired by uh, this discussion here uh, today. Uh, she says, like those other 30 something women that you mentioned um, earlier. And uh, one of the things she finds most inspiring is the emphasis on care and taking care of each other. Uh, such as finding or developing skills, uh, building women leaders, and building the organization that you wanted it to be. Um, so her question in particular is, um, she's wondering if the speakers could talk more about the emphasis on taking care of each other. And um, she says, especially as we uh, look to build a better future. So um, how did you take care of each other? Um, in the work that you did. I think I would just add, and you guys probably have better answers to this than I do, but one of the things I think we did in nine to five that was different than other unions in other settings is that we really operated collaboratively. Like we really respected each other's opinions. We listened to each other. Um, and that became, you know, caring about each other personally as well as uh, professionally. And, um, it, you know, when I have been in other union unions where I felt like it was really top down and sort of one guy at the top sort of calling all the shots, as we all know, know some of those unions, um, I think that nine to five was very collaborative and that turned into respecting, trusting and supporting each other. It, that's fair to say, you guys. Yeah, I, I found um that I often, I was surprised to hear what was coming out of my own mouth. And I felt like I did my best thinking in a group with other people. And uh, when I was researching for my book, I found an interview by Kim. Um, someone had interviewed her about her development as an organizer. And she talked about how she had been mentored by a woman, Bonnie Layden, who was one of our early union organizers. And Kim said, you know, my instinct was just to tell people what to do. But Bonnie said, don't do that. Um, always ask people what they think the answer to their question is. And Bonnie uh, implemented that with Kim herself. So Kim would go to her mentor, Bonnie, and say, well, what do I do? I don't know what to do. And Bonnie would say, well, what do you think? And um, I, think, I think we really, uh, really, really developed that um, in our organization. And it was really, um, it wasn't like some people had the answers and the other people didn't, uh, partly because uh, no one had the answers. So we were all <laughs> really learning this as we were all along. learning at the same time. And we really were dependent on each other um, for to figure out the way forward. And we did that. And that was, you know, you could think of that as, as um, a problem, you know, that we didn't know what we were doing. But in fact, I think it worked to our advantage in some ways. Right. Right. I think I, I can't emphasize enough 
the importance of listening to people, to listening to the people you're organizing. Um, because for one thing, it shows respect for them when you listen to them and what they care about and what they, they're concerned with. Um, and also you learn a lot. You know, we don't have, organizers don't have all the answers. And um, we, we develop some of the answers by listening to, to the members and to, to the workforce. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, listening to people, asking them questions is, is really fundamental to good organizing. Wonderful. Um, so um, Nathan, is there another uh, question that uh, can be asked you know, from our chat? Ab absolutely. Um, so we have uh, with us today, uh, Michelle from WESA, our local uh, 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 public uh, broadcast, uh, local NPR affiliate, local public broadcasting uh, radio station. Uh, she asked, what specifically did your organization do or work with in Western Pennsylvania? She, she was struck in the documentary how there's a lot of um, emphasis and action about what was going on in Cleveland and noted that it kind of jumped over Pittsburgh. So uh, could you, in, in the documentary, so could you talk about um, uh, what activity uh, might have taken place in, in this area? Actually, we have, we have with us Betty Arendt, who was an organizer for nine to five in Pittsburgh. Oh Is, yeah. Uh, didn't you do that, Betty? Are you going to join us? Yes, and I was the director here in Pittsburgh back in the dark ages so long ago. <laughs> um, and we did all the things you guys have been talking about. I, you refreshed my memory of we started out surveying people and then we did lots and lots of one-on-one -on -one meetings every day, coffee and coffee and lunch and then more coffee yeah. and, and meeting people who were not identifying themselves as part of the women's movement, um, but, but actually felt that they were being um, deprived of their rights, of their dignity. And um, we used uh, a lot of lessons that Ellen, uh, you especially taught us and Karen about um, finding hubris ways to confront those in power that um, kind of gave us permission to do it. We couldn't really have done it in a more formal kind of, and you talked about this, this, the picket lines really didn't fly. So we did things like awards for the worst boss in town. Mm -hmm. And um, we would take them a goofy award. <laughs> and um, and uh, so we, we, we actually had a lot of fun. Uh, Jane Fonda did come to Pittsburgh. Um, this was while they were working on the movie. Uh, she came to the YWCA downtown and uh, gave a speech uh, um, in support of the uh, nine to five movement. And um, it was a thrill. It was a lot of fun. Hard work, but a lot of fun. Yeah, Pittsburgh was one of the most successful nine to five chapters. So kudos to you, Betty, and the others that, that made that all happen. Um, um, the next question, Nathan, that's one, that was wonderful. Thank you, Betty. It's good to see you. Well, uh, Gabe, Gabe Kramer has a, a number of, of questions, but one, one that uh, one he has is uh, talking about the core organizers of 925 uh, and 9 number 25. <laughs> Did the organizers share a particular political outlook together? or what kind of diversity of views was there among uh, the organizers uh, politically? Mm. I, think that, I think that our gospel was organizing. <laughs> so you think, I'm not sure we had a political view necessarily. I mean, a lot of us were progressive probably, but I mean, the one thing that we really held together in the union, I mean, what made, I think, District 9 to 5 and Local 9 to 5, so powerful is the just unanimous commitment to organizing in everything, in every way that we did our work. Don't you think, Ann? Yeah, right. Um, I mean, some of us, 
did come out of the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement. Um, and, um, and some had been involved in the women's liberation movement. Um, so there, there was some, there was some commonality of perspective um, there, but I think we were also um, searching for something broader, something that would reach working class women, um, the largest, the clericals, the largest sector of the workforce at the time. And, and so uh, although we came out of some of those other movements, we, uh, we were really stretching ourselves to do some things differently so that we could reach more people. Yeah. And I think that the, the form that we were organized, the, the organization quickly became completely all consuming and we left behind, um, you know, the, the tactics of the student movement or the anti-war movement, um, which had served their purpose for those movements. But we were, we were making it up as we went along. And um, for example, when nine to five began um, before we launched in 1973, we spent about a year sitting around in a group that was like a consciousness raising group talking about our common experiences. But we realized that that wasn't going to be the form of what we were going to build, that we were not going to be able to bring in lots and lots of women and really make change in the downtown workforce with that format. And so we developed these other things, you know, what kind of meetings are we going to have and what kind of, um, you know, demonstrations and these funny things with the bad boss contest and so on. Um, so it, it sort of our, the, the movement we were building became our worldview. Mm-hmm. We, it didn't, it didn't it I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt anybody. Did you, somebody want to add as to the comments? I just wanted to say that, um, you know, Ellen said we kind of were, were making it up as we were going along and that's true. And a big part of that was, uh, that we wanted to influence public opinion. And so we did a lot of press work and we did a lot of activities and creative activities that we thought would get local press. And it did, it worked, that worked. I mean, we had, we had press in, in the areas where we were organizing on a regular basis. Um, so that was part of our approach was to try to influence public opinion as well as organize you know, the clerical workers. Well, it sounds like you uh, took your own advice. I mean, uh, earlier I asked you about, well, what do you, what do you uh, suggest for today's activists? And your advice was, well, forge your own path. And it sounds like you <laughs> forged your own path. <laughs> so, so thank you. So Nathan, do we have other questions? Uh, certainly. Uh, Philomena uh, D asks, um, she is curious about, um, did some of the women who did not identify as feminist originally, I know you had mentioned that, um, did they become feminist in their thinking over time uh, once they were involved? Did you see that? That's a great question. Um, I think something that happened over and over again was people would come into the organization and say, write and emphasize, I'm not a feminist. Just want you to know I'm not a feminist. Mm -hmm. But then uh, they would say, well, you know, we would probe and they'd, well, do you believe in equal pay for equal work? Yes. Do you think women are getting a raw deal? Yes. Do you think that's connected to their being women? Yes. And then people would begin to think, hmm, maybe I am kind of a feminist. That didn't mean that they uh, wanted to tell everybody that. Um, but I think people started to embrace, you know, what feminism really is about. Um, and and uh, as someone says in the movie, we were developing our own brand of feminism. And that was something that women workers were able to feel part of in a way that they might not have felt part of some of the early um, women's movement of the late 60s. Although um, I think that movement gets a bad rap in some ways because the earliest issue for the women's liberation movement was equal pay. And I think people forget that. So we need to remember that. I would just, I would just add to that question, actually, if there's any of you on this call who've ever been an organizer, 
uh, what you know uh, about organizing, and that's what, what's most exciting about organizing, as you all have said, is you, you, know, you get to work with people where they're at, and you get to watch them grow and change their opinions and change their lives, right? And feminism was just one part of that change that we watched women go through in our organization. Um, that was so inspiring to me to watch. And I, I love to tell the story about women I would meet and the first time I'd meet him, they'd tell me, well, I have to ask my husband if I can talk to you first, you know, that story. And then by the end, you know, they were like, you know, running the organization and, you know, like you know, they, would, they would tell their husband what, what. What's what? <laughs> um, it's great to see people change um, uh, in, in the process of organizing. And we change too. I mean, yes. I grew up in nine to five and Absolutely. became a different person. Yeah. Pam, do you have any other questions? Or any other comments on this matter? Anne Hill? No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, Nathan, are there other questions? Yes, <laughs> we have more. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can um, <laughs> um, so, um, Allison at, uh, points out that uh, unions in the U.S. are the largest organizations of women here in Pittsburgh. And she asks, what should unions embrace more in unions' women's activism, uh, leadership? and in the women workers who don't have a union yet? I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what should unions embrace? Yes, in terms of uh, women's activism, uh, women's leadership, and, and all those women out there who they don't, aren't part of a union yet. Yeah. How do we empower the uh, union? The non-union sector out there. Well, we'll make it easier for women to become active on the job. What can unions do to make that easier? Let me just say that um, it's been true for a long time that where there's a majority of women at a workplace is more likely to win a union election. Women support unions more than their male co-workers do. But I, I also think that unions um, need to be more um, flexible about um, the model and the approach they're going to take. They take to organizing. I think so few unions are willing to take risks and put money into organizing unless it, you know, they get payback by, a, you know, from their members paying dues in a short period of time. And it's just not the reality for so many women workers and so many women who are not in unions, they don't have the option to have a traditional union or it's impossible to organize in those industries. So I would like to see unions be um, sort of more willing to be creative about organizing models. That, and, and that would, I think, open up uh, unions to women much more. Okay, um, only one or two more questions, Nathan, before we have to wrap up. Okay, so um, Millie asks, uh, do you have anything to say to men who oppose women's rights today? Says <laughs> I don't have time for you. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> I like it does that. touch on a, a theme of our early organizing that, you know, when we were getting started, there were a lot of theories going around about how, you know, women office workers couldn't be organized because they were in love with their boss or they were too timid or they bought the whole stereotype of, you know, that women shouldn't speak up and this, that and the other. And um, our view was that we didn't want to talk about any of that. You know, maybe some of those things were true, but the problem was not women. The issue was not men. Women were going to stand up and uh, demand what we were worth, and uh, men were going to have to listen. So, uh, you know, we we organized the power and we we made change. Um, anybody else? Uh, one more, one last question, Nathan. Okay, I have uh, one here from Ramo who. Um, he mentions the idea that, you know, we have a global economy now, we have a diverse workforce, 
Um, we have all these transnational firms. Um, we have uh, corporations still using abusive employment tactics mm -hmm. um, and anti-union training. Um, so seeing in today's environment, what advice would you give both those entering the world of work as well as current activists? Think bigger. I mean, I do think his, his point is, is well taken that um, we can't be just, you know, we can't just be about ourselves or the people around us. Um, once, you know, once we actually find our power, I have to think we, I think we have to think bigger and understand how connected the world is. That would be my thought on it. What, what do you guys think? Sounds right. That's a tough one. Yeah, That's a tough one. Yeah. How do you organize the Amazon workers all over the country? I mean, all over the world, right? Yeah, all right. over the world, right? It's it's uh, it's a tough. It is hard. A tough environment right now. I, I really don't know. Right. Just, yeah. Well, you know that we, song. Every generation's got to win it again. You know, it never ends. It's never like okay, we got there. We're there. That's it. Yeah, uh, well, that's a, that's a good segue into my comment before I turn it over to John Hare to wrap us up here this evening is that I just want to thank you women for truly empowering so many millions of women and men and uh, bringing them into associations and into unions to give voice to their concerns and needs uh, uh, and to uh, making a tremendous difference in terms of their wages and their hours of employment, their respect on the job and their benefits. And uh, bravo to you. I'm so glad that you came this evening uh, uh, because we do have a lot to celebrate in terms of women's history and you're definitely a part of women's history. So thank you. Let's all give them a virtual hand clap. There's a hand clap, uh, Sydney. <laughs> but uh, and, and, yes, and I, I want to say a Rosa. wonderful evening and uh, so thank you. Rosemary, for those of for those who may not know, you were one of Nine to Five's biggest champions, and we rested on your shoulders. So people should should know that you were really key to our success. Thank you, thank you, and I'm proud to have been a part of it. Thank you so much. So, John, take us home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you're not muted. You're muted. <laughs> you need your speaker on. I'm happy to take us home, although I've really been enjoying the ride. Uh, what a wonderful presentation tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Ann and, and, and Kim and Alan and Rosemary. Um, uh, it's really, for me, a trip down memory lane. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's so wonderful to uh, reflect on, um, on uh, what seems to have been only... Um, a few moments ago, <laughs> but it turns out to be 40 or 50 years. So um, special thank yous also to Suzanne Donsky, a, a chair of our uh, program committee for her steadfast uh, requirement that uh, we need to um, make sure we know what we're doing as we do our programs. And um, also uh, uh, Tess, thanks so much as our engineer tonight, I feel so confident when you're at the controls. And also, um, Larry, uh, Larry McCullough, uh, your heroic work in, in uh, spreading the word about this event and, and um, being our connection to the press and, and to others has been a real help to our organization, a real boon to our organization. Thank you, uh, Susan and Larry. And um, I've also been thinking tonight about uh, Julia and Steve, Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar. And um, when I think about these 50 years that um, we've been talking about, um, I can almost associate a movie that, that Julia first um, had, had made uh, showing us back our movements. Uh, and it's, they have a wonderful history. And and a, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful closet full of media uh, that is so instructive and right on the beam. 
And I, I want them to know that, how meaningful uh, that is to people organizing. And we really appreciate it. Uh, they deserve, you know, a hundred Oscars uh, for, for the, the parts of life that they've uncovered and helped people to learn how to organize. So thank you so much, Julia and, th and Steve. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, thank everyone else from coming. I want to say it is not our usual practice to ask you when we first meet you to go on mute. Um, it's, we do think that it's, it's the best way that we can use the time that we have when we're online together uh, and, and to, to have uh, an organized presentation and a focused exchange. However, we do have times when we want, uh, when the mute is off, uh, although we do try to chair our meetings, uh, what they are are, are breakfasts. Uh, the Battle of Homestead Foundation is known, uh, was known before uh, COVID as having uh, Wednesday morning breakfast at the Eaton Park. Whoever wants to come is welcome to come and encouraged and to come. Homestead. Uh, I'm at the Eaton Park and Homestead. Thanks, Joni. <laughs> and um, uh, we hope to have them again sometime. In the meantime, we have uh, what we call our breakfast, our Zoom breakfast, every other Wednesday morning. And I want to invite those of you that would like to have a cup of coffee in the morning, if you have some time with some friends, uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to attend our, our breakfast. Now, the next breakfast are going to be next Wednesday. They're every other Wednesday morning, next Wednesday, March the 30th at 9.30. Uh, and two weeks later, April 13th at 9.30. And um, as we go through April and we're aiming towards May 1, our hope is that we can have our first in-person breakfast back to the Eaton Park oh. in Homestead. We'll see. Uh, fingers crossed that uh, we'll be able to do so. Uh, at the breakfast, basically, they're not really meetings, but uh, they are organized insofar as um, we insist that only one person talk at a time. Um, but we discuss community affairs, organizations, activities, social action issues of the day, announcements of up upcoming events, and anything of interest. From time to time, we have uh, guests passing through town that are interested in in. Um, talking with us or have published a, a book uh, and we're happy to have them uh, and we also from time to time have new uh, new progressives on this on the political scene that want to introduce themselves and they're welcome they're welcome to do so um, for three or four minutes not not as a big speech but you are welcome to come and if you follow our website or get our our uh, email blasts uh, please do so come to our breakfast uh, we are also, I want to tell just a little bit real quickly about some of the programs coming up this year. Um, we, have, uh, we have a number of them uh, in the progress of production right now. Uh, the next will focus on a theme uh, that uh, we have uncovered called Death of a Jewish Radical in Erie, 10, uh, 1022, Echoes from a Century Ago a panel discussion focusing on a brutal murder of Herman Martius, the grandfather of one of our, our uh, Battle Homestead Foundation members and uh, union activist uh, uh, and members Kip Dawson's grandmother. Uh, Martius and his wife Be Beatrice were active in the local chapter of Friends of Soviet Russia in Erie, and they agitated for justice and equality 100 years ago, including support for the 1922 miners' strike. Um, Martius, Martius's murder coincided with Ku Klux Klan new organizing efforts in the Erie area and um, presenter uh, in, the, in the KKK may likely have been involved in the murder. Uh, Kip and a panel, there will be a panel discussion with Professor Lou Martin, two of his students who have researched the incidents, interviewed Kip and created a website about the matter. Um, we also have an upcoming talk by historian professor, a former uh, Pitt, Pitt uh, history uh, student, Ron Schatz, featuring his new book, The Labor Board Crew, Remaking Worker-Employee Relations, 
from Pearl Harbor to the Reagan era, and it describes a collective biography of the architects of post-war U.S. industrial relations. Uh, Schatz's book focuses on the development ultimate decline of the National War Labor Board, which was created to resolve union management conflicts during World War II. Uh, we also have uh, programs on tap looking at labor and the environment, uh, the perils of plastics, emerging opportunities for reincarnation of manufacturing with a focus on developing alternatives to plastics. We are uh, in July uh, going to uh, observe the 130th anniversary of the Battle of Homestead. Uh, July 6th was the, uh, the day of, uh, of the uh, attempted landing by the Pinkertons. And we're going to celebrate it by having a breakfast at the pump house. That's a Wednesday, that's a Wednesday morning. Uh, and we are also working this year, um, talk about renewed interest uh, through the work of um, the uh, Rivers of Steel Heritage Corporation. A uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, grant was secured. And um, there will be a seminar here in Pittsburgh where two cohorts of approximately 30 secondary school teachers throughout the country will be coming here for a, a week seminar on teaching about the Battle of Homestead. And mm. we're, pleased, we're pleased that we have um, uh, three Battle of Homestead members that'll be serving with a larger crew of, um, of presenters and, and faculty members for that seminar. And we're also pleased that we'll be able to uh, present a small cultural program to the um, uh, to the guests that will be here attending the seminar, and we have the artists to sing and to present their visual works and their dramatic readings that will be part of that of that cultural event. Um, there's other uh, other things uh, coming. We are looking at uh, uh, producing a professional production called Mother Jones in Heaven. It's a, it's a uh, single person, uh, a single person presentation in theater written by singer songwriter and activist Cy Khan. So uh, this is what's coming up and we would love to have you participate and to hear your ideas as well and check out our website and, and uh, you are welcome to come. And uh, with that, I want to say uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, keep the faith and remember the solidarity. Uh, thank you so much. Take care and see you next time.